Well, good evening, boys and girls. It's so good to see you again. Isn't God good? Yes, all the time, isn't he? I, uh, I think this is going to be a, uh, an interesting study tonight. I think you guys are going to be, some of you, surprised. And um, because this man of sin is hiding in plain sight. Revelation seminar number three, the Antichrist. This is a big one. And uh, actually, the book of Revelation covers even more details on the Antichrist. So we're going to do the introduction of the Antichrist tonight. He's called the man of sin. Uh, five places in the Bible it covers this in detail. Um, We've got Daniel 7, which is what we're going to cover tonight. We're also going to cover parts of Revelation 13, though next week we will cover Revelation 13 in detail. That is the beast power that gives you the mark of the beast, okay? Then we've got the 2 Thess Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. We've got Daniel 8, 23 through 25. Tonight we will not cover Revelation 17 at all, but we're going to cover four of these tonight. Not all of it in detail. We will cover more of it next week. So, but Revelation 17 is going to be the ninth night. And this is an amalgamation, a transformation of the beast power. It's going to be interesting. Let no one deceive you, Paul says, by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's pretty heavy stuff. Who is this man of sin? Well, it is the same thing as Revelation 13, and we'll cover that next week. Revelation 13 is the beast power, the man of sin, the antichrist power, and next week we will cover that one in detail. Uh, we covered Daniel 2 uh, in the, uh, the countries on night night, uh, night one, and it was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Europe. That's what the divisions of these different metals represented. This is just a little bit of a, a recap. Then we covered Daniel 7, the four great beasts which came out of the great sea. What was the great sea in the Bible? Mediterranean Sea, that's right. And uh, I saw in my vision, uh, Daniel said, by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and the four great beasts came up from the sea. Uh, that great sea is the Mediterranean Sea today, and uh, um, the first beast was likened to a lion, had two wings of an eagle. How? Why wings? Speed and conquering. That's exactly right. That represented what country? Do you remember? Babylon. That's exactly right. Then we had the next country that came into power, which is a world kingdom, which was Medo-Persia, had three ribs in its mouth, and it was lifted up on one side. Why was it lifted up on one side? One side of the kingdom was more powerful than the other because two kingdoms came together. The Medes and the Persians came together and the Persians were more powerful. They had three ribs in its mouth because it conquered three kingdoms, Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. All right? And then we have the next kingdom that came into power that had a leopard skin and four heads and four wings. And Greece, that's exactly right, Lori. It's uh, Greece. And when Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided into four parts. The four generals took over, and that's why it has four heads. And then we had the last beast, which was uh, terrible. It was a terrible beast. It crushed everything that came into its path. It had great iron teeth. And that iron teeth, that iron kingdom was what kind? Was Rome. That's right. And then it had ten horns that came out of its head. And what did that represent? The division of Europe after the fall in 476 AD. That's right. That's exactly right. Thus he said, the fourth, king, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. That was the Iron Kingdom of Rome. And it represented the iron legs in the image of Daniel 2. 
It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And Rome fell in 476 AD. It was the longest reigning empire of the four. And, uh, and then it was a division of Europe, which represented the ten toes in, in, in Daniel 2 and the ten horns in Daniel 7. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, the division of Europe after the fall of Rome. And this is the names that they had today. We call them Germany, France. You know those countries very well. And, uh, and England and all the rest of them. All right. So the little horn comes up. This little horn is the bad guy. All right. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were the eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, time, and a half time. Daniel's introducing the Antichrist power. Now, what are the identifying marks of the little horn as they appear through Daniel 7 and 8? Well, first of all, it's a little horn. Okay, so we know it's a little one. Number two, he came up among the ten. All right. Number three, he is different than the other horns. Number four, the little horn is more powerful than the other horns. He came up shortly after the ten horns were in power. The little horn plucked up three of the horns. He had the eyes of a man. He had a mouth speaking great things against the Most High. He, had, he made war with the saints. He would think to change times and laws, and not by his own power. And it shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and a dividing time, which, which represents 1260 years. We covered that last night. Now, I... Um, this time period, this time, time, and dividing of time is found seven times in the Bible. Three times in the book of Daniel is called time, times, and half time. Two times in the book of Revelation is called 42 months. And, and two times in the book of Revelation is called 1260 days. God, in his infinite wisdom, put it three different ways so that we could finally catch on. All right? Who is the little horn? Who is this man of sin? Now, this, is, uh, this has been a big question for many, many years, and everybody has wondered. Now, you know that it isn't someone that's going to reign three and a half years at the end of time, because it, it showed that he would reign in power for 1260 years, not the same man, but the beast power is a kingdom with a man at its head. Okay? Does that make sense to you? All right. So who is this guy? Well, every single Protestant reformer of the Protestant Reformation said that this man of sin is the Pope and the papacy as a system with the Pope at its head. Are they correct? Now, we'll have to take a look at this, okay? So we have these 12 identifying marks of the papacy. What we're going to do is look and see are they correct. But first, I want you to see what they said. John Calvin, who was a Presbyterian, said this, Some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of pres presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt. I shall briefly show that Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2 are not capable of any other interpretation than that which applies them to the Papacy. Now, for many, many years, I had every single reformer's opinion on, a, on my computer, and my computer died. So I only have a few of these in my PowerPoint. But rest assured, there wasn't one dissenting vote on this. Now, we're going to find out, are they correct? And if they're not, we'll just throw it out, okay? 
Um, John Knox says this, that tyranny which the Pope himself has so, for so many ages exercised over the church, the very antichrist and son of perdition of whom Paul speaks. And then uh, Thomas Cranmer, who happens to be <clears throat> one of my heroes, <clears throat> he died by being burned at the stake. <clears throat> he was an Anglican bishop. He said this, whereof it followeth Rome to be the seat of Antichrist and the Pope to be very Antichrist himself. I could prove the same by many other scriptures, old writers, and strong reasons. Roger Williams, who was a first, first Baptist pastor in America, said this. Pastor Williams spoke of the Pope as the pretended vicar of Christ. That means someone in place of Christ who sits as God over the temple of God, exalting himself not only above all that is called God, but over the souls and consciences of his vassals. Yea, over the spirit of Christ, over the Holy Spirit, yea, and God himself, speaking against the God of heaven, thinking to change times and laws, but he is the son of perdition. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Westminster Confession of Faith says this, there is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, the man of sin and son of perdition that exalteth himself, against, uh, exalted himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. Now, I mentioned to you this earlier, there's only two people that are called the son of perdition. Judas and the Antichrist, okay? Just remember that. John Wesley, who was a Methodist, said this. Speaking of the papacy, John Wesley wrote, he is in an emphatical sense the man of sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure. And he is too properly styled the son of perdition, as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes both of his opposers and followers. He it is that exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, claiming the highest power, the highest honor, claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone. Bless you, thank you very much. Yeah, I'll just sit right there. We are here, now Martin Luther, who was a Lutheran, okay, the first Lutheran, he says this, we are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. Um, John Wycliffe, who wrote the first, who translated the, the English Bible, the first person that translated the Bible into English, he said this, the Pope is Antichrist here on earth. For saying that, he was burned at the stake. There are 12 clues to, the, to who is the Antichrist in the book of Daniel. We're going to cover them point by point now. Well, of the 12 clues, if it is impossible, if you have one of them that isn't right, then you throw it all out. Does that make sense to you? In other words, if one of those clues don't match the Pope, then throw the whole thing out, all right? Now, in order to get all 12, it's one in 14 million chance. So this is pretty heavy stuff, all right? Now, we pride ourselves on being able to study the Bible because we have computers and we can study anything anywhere. These men actually took the Bible apart piece by piece and studied every single section of the Bible. Some of these men knew the entire New Testament by memory. It's incredible. All right, clue number one, it's a little nation, all right? I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them. Now, is it a little nation, the little horn? Ten horns are the nations of Europe. We know that. The Vatican City is uh, two-tenths of a square mile, 109 acres. It's the world's smallest nation. The Vatican has a population of 842. But during this, the Dark Ages where they ruled Europe, that papal see was much larger. But it still was smaller than any other of the countries of Europe. All right? Now, clue number one. Does the papacy fulfill that? This is a small nation. Yes. So we're going to check that one off, okay? Clue number two. The first ones will go really, really fast. Clue number two is its origin is in Europe, all right? It says, I was considering the horns, and there was another one, a little one, coming up among them. 
all right? So it had to come out of the European area. Does it do that? Yes. So clue number two, you can check that one off. Clue number three, did the reformers understand what the ten horns represented? Yes, they did. In fact, John Wycliffe, who burned, got burned at the stake by the papacy, uh, the ten horns are the whole of our temporal rulers. All right? So they knew what these horns represented. All right? Clue number three, came into power after 476. The reason why we say that is another shall arise after them. The them is the ten horns. So it had to rise up in power after Europe was already divided. All right, did it? History shows that the papacy was established in power in 538 AD by the decree of Justinian. So we can check that one off. It fits it. Clue number four. Three nations are removed in its rise to power. All right? So the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Now, this was the division of Europe during that time. The Hurliai, Ostrogoths, and Vandals opposed the papacy to be the head of the European nations. And the rest of them went to war with them and completely annihilated them. And then put the Pope in power. So, does this clue fit? Yes. So we'll check that one off. Clue number five. Clue number five, he will be more powerful than the other horns or nations. All right? Daniel 7.20 says whose appearance was greater than his fellows. And the King James Version says whose look was more stout than his fellows. And uh, here's a history book that says under the Roman Empire, the popes had no temporal power under the Roman Empire. But when Rome fell, it changed. But when the Roman Empire had disintegrated and in its place uh, had been taken by a number of rude, barbarous kingdoms, the Roman Catholic Church not only became independent of the states in religious affairs, but dominated secular affairs as well. It's what we call the Holy Roman Empire. And it was not holy but it surely was Roman, okay? Under him, here's another uh, history book, under him, the Pope, was very nearly made good, the papal claim that all earthly sovereigns were mere vassals of the Roman pontiff. Almost all the kings and princes of Europe swore fealty or allegiance to him as their overlord. Rome was once more the mistress of the world. So, clue number five, does it fit? He will be more powerful than the other horns or nations. Absolutely yes, all right, check that one off. Clue number six, okay, he will be different. He shall be different from the first ones, okay? Uh, what does history reveal? Out of the ruins of the Roman Empire, there gradually arose a new order of states whose central point was the papal see. Therefore, inevitably resulted a position not only new, but very different from the former, all right? The 10 kingdoms were political organizations only. This little horn would claim authority like God and thus was religious and political. So was it different? Yes, so we'll check number six off. So the first six go very, very fast. Now, Clue number seven is about blasphemy, okay? A mouth speaking pompous words, Daniel 7. And in Revelation 13, it says he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, okay? Now, what is blasphemy? Does anybody here care to give me a definition of blasphemy? There's two. See, saying that he is God and anybody else? Forgive sins. Who said that? Raise your hand. Okay, a star for you and a star for you. That's exactly right. The two definitions, all right? So, children, you get your star on your way out. All right, so what is blasphemy? We have definitions, two examples in the Bible. That is blasphemy, okay? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you. They're talking to Jesus. Uh, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. Well, he was God. He is God. He never wasn't a God. He was God in the flesh, and he dwelt among us, right? 
So he could claim to be God, and it wasn't blasphemy for him. But if I claim to be God, that's blasphemy, right? All right. Now, the second example is this. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, because he was God, he could forgive sins. Do you remember the guy that was let down through the roof that was a paralytic? And, and Jesus looked at him, and all of his friends, they just dropped him right in the middle of the room. And Jesus says, son, thy sins are forgiven you. And the man rested in peace. Well, then he says, take up thy bed and walk. So they said, they were complaining, who can forgive sins but God? He says, so that you know that I can forgive sins, take up your bed and walk. The guy leaped up, grabbed his bed, and walked right out. He proved that he is God. All right, so the Antichrist, what does Antichrist mean? A lot of people think that Antichrist means against God, Christ, but it doesn't. Okay, so now when I was taking Greek, we studied this out pretty thoroughly. Antichristos. Now, you, when you look at this, the first letter is A. a. The second letter actually is an N. The V in Greek is an N. The next letter is a T and then an I, and this X is CH, okay? Now, when you look at Xmas during Christmas, that X is Christ, all right? Because that's his name, Antichristos. That word right there is Antichristos. So it's X, which is a CH. The next letter is an R. I know that sounds really crazy, but that's an R, I, and then the next letter is S, T O. And then, yes. All right, so antichristos, anti in Greek doesn't mean against. What it means, it's a Greek word that means in place of, okay? It's instead of. He is the vicar of Christ. He is in place of Christ. Do you make sense? Does that make sense to you? By way of substitution, in place of, instead of. This is the Greek definition. All right? Now, Antichrist, the Antichrist, is in place of Christ, not against him. The son of perdition, Judas, was pretending he was a Christian. All right? This man of sin is pretending he's a Christian when he's working for the devil. Does that make sense to you? All right. Judas was pretending he was a Christian when he was working for the devil. The Antichrist is pretending he's a Christian, and he, in fact, is working for the devil. That's why he's called the son of perdition, all right? He is in place of Christ. I am like God, all right? Now, we'll go on. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Does the Pope fit this definition of blasphemy? Well, let's take a look. Now, what I'm, what I'm going to bring to you tonight is are the writings from the papacy itself. Now, papacy is the governing body of the Catholic Church. It is not the Catholic people. Keep that in mind. Just like the government of the United States, the senators and uh, the House of Representatives and all those guys, they're not us. All right. When I go and travel around the world, and I travel quite a bit, when I go travel around the world, they don't look at me like I'm the president of the United States. They look at me like I'm a human. All right. Not that they're not, but what I'm saying is they treat me really nice. I have friends that, uh, from, from uh, the UK that visited Iraq, and, and these people were so nice. Uh, no, Iran. And these people were so nice, they invited them home in their own homes. Now, we are against the Iranian government. The Iranian government is against the United States. But the people are different. And keep that in mind as we go through this study. It isn't the Catholic people that these reformers were against. It was the papacy as a governing body and the pope at its head. Does that make sense to you? All right, so keep that in mind. There's a lot of born-again Christians in the Catholic Church. All right, does the Pope fit the definition of blasphemy? These are their writings, and they are very proud of them, and you can go to the Catholic Encyclopedia and to the, Catholic, the papacy's website, and you can find every one of these. We're going to give you a handout when you leave with these quotes. All right? The Pope is not only... Uh, the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself hidden under the veil of flesh. 
Is that blasphemy? Yes. All right. Does the priest truly forgive the sins, or does he only declare that they are remitted? The priest does really and truly forgive the sins in virtue of the power given to him by Christ. Is that blasphemy? Yes. All right. The pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God, and the vicar of God in place of God. All right? Antichristos. All right? And God himself is obliged obliged to abide by the judgment of his priest and to either not to pardon or to pardon. So if the priest says you're pardoned, God has to obey him. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, seek where you will, through heaven and earth, and you will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner. That extraordinary being is the priest of the, Catholic, the Catholic priest. Now, that's pretty heavy stuff. To pardon a single sin requires all the omnipotence of God. The Jews justly said, who can forgive sins but God alone? But what only God can do by his omnipotence, the priest can also do by saying this Latin phrase, I absolve you of your sins. All right, the Pope is as it were God on earth, sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief of kings, having plentitude of power, in whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent God direction not only of earthly, but also of the heavenly kingdom. So he controls things in heaven is what they're claiming. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Now that is Antichristos in place of God. The Pope holdeth place on earth, not simply of a man, but of the true God, dissolves not by human, but rather by divine authority. I am in all and above all, so that God himself and I, the vicar of God, hath both one consistory, and I am able to do almost all that God can do. Wherefore, if those things that I do be said not to be done of man but of God, what do you make of me but God? Wow. Is that blasphemy? Okay. All right, you guys are getting it. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Now that is Antichristos. All right. Transubstantiation. Most of us are not aware of what this is, but this is the doctrine that more people were burned at the stake. Over 50 million people were burned at the stake. Credible estimates were 50 to 100 million, all right? Were burned at the stake during the 1260 years that the papacy was in power in Europe. And most of them, it was over this doctrine, transubstantiation. What is transubstantiation? Well, they say that they can turn this wine into the actual blood of Christ. And they can turn the bread in communion in the actual flesh of Christ. All right, now watch where we're going with this. The Catholic priest has power to create his creator. The power of the priest is the power of the divine person. For the transubstantiation of the bread requires as much power as the creation of the world. Thus, the priest may be called the creator of the creator. If the mass is to be something more than a passion play, then not only must Christ appear in his real personality on the altar, but he, also, uh, but he must also be in some manner really sacrificed on that very altar. When the priest pronounces the tremendous words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens, brings Christ down from his throne, and places, upon, places him upon our altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of man. But what does Paul say? Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Once only. All right? He has a mouth speaking pompous words. Is that pompous? Yes. And he, has, uh, he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Does he fit this description? Yes. What does Paul say? Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come, that day, the day of Christ's coming, the second coming, will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he sits as God 
in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Does it fit? Absolutely, yes. Now, these are bishops that bow down to the Pope. Would you do this? Nope. They even worship the Pope, unfortunately. How does God look at this? Well, I remember in the book of Acts, Cornelius, who was a centurion, and he, um, that means he was in charge of a hundred soldiers. He was quite wealthy, and he was praying, Lord, are you there? Are you real? Are you, uh, I'm just anxious to know you. I want to know you. I want to be, uh, I want to be a friend of yours. I want to worship you. And he was praying earnestly, and God sent his angel and said to him, go, send your servants to find Peter. He is at a straight street. Go find him and bring him here and he will teach you. So they went to find him. In the meantime, Peter is up on a roof and he's praying and, and, and he sees this vision come out of God, out of heaven. And it was all manner of unclean, unclean animals in there. He goes, Lord, I've, he, they said, God said, kill and eat. He goes, I've never eaten anything unclean ever in my life. And he goes, what does that mean? And then these people came to find him. And the sin, he says, they said, God wants, uh, God told us uh, through Cornelius to come and get you so you can teach him. And then Peter says, now I know that God was telling me not to call any man common or unclean because at the time they thought a Gentile couldn't be saved crazy, isn't it? Yeah. It'd be like saying, because uh, you're black, you can't be saved. You know, that's, so, that's today, we would think that's so stupid, right? All right. So, so you wouldn't say, or, or because you're German, you can't be saved because you're related to Hitler. Okay. You can't say those kinds of things because it's just not true. It's a bald-faced lie because God doesn't care. He doesn't care where you're from, what your background is, what your nationality is. He doesn't care that my daughter-in-law is Chinese descent. He doesn't care that my other one is from uh, Central America. He doesn't care because he loves everyone equally. And Peter got that message, right? All right. Now, how does God look at this? Well, let's take a look. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up. I myself am also a man. Don't you dare worship me. You know? So, so Peter was supposed to be the first pope and the popes want to be worshipped. Don't you think they ought to have this example of Peter? You know, if they're really followers, but they're not. All right? Now, here's another example. All right, Revelation 19.10, an angel came to John, the revelator, and he said, he, 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 uh, John thought it was Jesus, so John fell at his feet to worship him. He said, I felt at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, don't worship me. All right, so he made it crystal clear that you don't worship a man. All right, so is the papacy a blasphemous power? Yes. Yeah, so let's check that one off, all right? Clue number eight. Clue number eight will rule with someone else's power. All right, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Did the papacy have its own army? No, they have Swiss guards to guard the, guard the pope, but they do not have an army and never have had an army. In fact, during these 1260 years, they told every king in Europe, your army is as, as my army. If I tell you to go attack somebody, you do it, or else I'll take you out of power. So they didn't have their own army. All right, did the Pope have his own army or did he use someone else's? Here is Pope Clem Clement the, uh, the, uh, the V's rebuke of King Edward II of England. We hear that you forbid torture as contrary to the laws of your land, but no state law can override the church's canon law, our law. Therefore, I command you at once to submit those men to torture. He could command any king in Europe to do anything he wanted to do, and he did. All right, did the papacy rule with someone else's power? Yes, we'll check that one off. Clue number nine, he will persecute God's people. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints. 
and prevailing against them. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now, this is what the Vatican II said. The church may, may, by divine right, confiscate the property of heretics, imprison their persons, and condemn them to the flames. If you disagreed during this 1260-year period, they would kill you by burning you to death while you were alive. This is, a, uh, this is in Mexico City, underneath the... Um, Underneath Mexico City, they have catacombs under the city, and Nan and I visited these. And um, when we went down there, there were these two, two hooks in the wall. There were two, two uh, things in the wall, and the whole wall was red, but it was limestone, all right? And when we walked by, I said, why is that whole wall red and the rest of it's all white? He said, that's where they, the Catholics, the Catholic priests tortured people to death, and the blood stained the walls. So now, this, this next picture I took uh, going under Paris. Under Paris, there are catacombs, catacombs uh, all under Paris, and they're 100 feet, 50 to 100 feet deep, all right, which is quite deep. So we had to climb down these stairs, very narrow. The fact is my shoulders hit the walls going down, and as you go down, you come into various rooms. These are the rooms, and this is where they tortured people to death. And they did this because they know no one could hear them from underground. And in fact, those are their bones. And these are their skulls and bones. And those are their faces of the people they tortured to death. I took these pictures myself. So when you think about the evilness of man when Satan gets into them, they will do anything, anything. I mean, you look at the history of our world. It just makes you say, Lord, come Jesus, quickly. I have friends. I, 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 I did some, done some mission work in Africa in the country of Rwanda. And I have friends there that are very close to me, my, some of my closest friends. And they went through the genocide in 1992 and the genocide of the Hutus and the Tutsis, the Hutus killing the Tutsis. And, and my friend, his my friend, who was my translator while I was there, he and I are, are really, really close, but his mother and sister, now his father was a Hutu, his mother was a Tutsi, but if the mother is a Tutsi, the daughter's a Tutsi, and if the father's a Hutu, the son is a Hutu. They chopped his mother and, 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 his, and, and his sister to death, but it let his father and himself go free because they were Hutus. The evilness of men is incredible when the, when the devil gets in them. And this is evidence of the fact that the devil is real. Those who bury persons, and they, they didn't bury them, all right? And this is why. Those who bury persons knowing them to be excommunicated or their receivers, defenders, or favorers shall not be absolved unless they dig up the corpse and the place shall be deprived of its usual immunities of sepulcher. They believed if they put the bones in the ground, there was a possibility of a resurrection. So they didn't put them in the ground. But God isn't limited by anything. All sects of heretics are condemned and various punishments are appointed for their accomplices. He is a heretic who does not believe what the Roman hierarchy teaches. A heretic merits the pains of fire. Heretics must be burned. The Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind. And will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. From the birth of popery to the present time, it's estimated by careful and credible historians that more than 50 million of the human family have been slaughtered for the crime of heresy by popus persecutors. Now, who, who put Hitler in power? Hitler and the papacy worked together. Now, when you look at this, the Church of Our Lady, this is Norberg, and this is when he f had his first rally. You see, the church is in the background. You see the church now a little clearer. And uh, here the bishops are congratulating him on winning 
uh, winning the election. Here they are, Heil Hitler. Uh, the papacy had a purpose, and they told him that they would support him as long as he killed Jews. And they admitted this about 10 years ago, out in, in the news, all right? And so they helped put him in power. And the fact is, after he died, in order to get the leadership out of Germany, they dressed him up as popes, as, as, as priests and bishops, and took them, most of them to Argentina. And that's uh, got a large German population in Argentina. All right? Here they are congratulating Hitler again. You see the, the bishops. I learned much from the order of the Jesuits. The Jesuits are the, the political arm of the papacy. They infiltrate governments, and they try to change things in favor of the Catholic Church. I learned much from the order of the Jesuits, said Hitler. Until now, there has never been anything more grandiose on the earth than the hierarchical organization of the Catholic Church. I transferred much of this organization into my own party. Here's Pope Benedict, okay? You remember him. And you'll look at him next door. That's when he was a kid. He was a Hitler youth. You see the swastika on his lapel? Adolf Hitler. Now, this is um, Franco. Franco was uh, Spain. He was the dictator of Spain. In fact, is they, went through a, they went through a civil war, and he won uh, control of Spain. They, did not, they considered themselves neutral during, uh, during World War II because uh, they had just fought. For, for several years. Adolf Hitler, he says of Adolf Hitler, son of the Catholic Church died while defending Christianity. It is therefore understandable that words cannot be found to lament over his death. <clears throat> when so many were found to exalt his life, over his mortal remains stands the victorious moral figure with the palm of the martyr. God gives Hitler the laurels of victory. What a bunch of garbage. He wasn't a martyr, he was a monster. And these people that think that they can get away with killing all of these innocent people will one day face the judgment of God. So we don't have to worry about them. God will take care of them. <clears throat> all right. Anybody ever hear of this book, Fox's Book of Martyrs? Good for you. You have it? Good for you. So if you go on YouTube and you put Fox's Book of Martyrs, they have 30-some-odd sections in there where you can go through the entire book and listen to the martyrs that went through this 1260-year period. It's quite a book. I've read it probably 12 times. It is a remarkable book. I would suggest anyone who wants to understand truth, this was written... These things were written during the times that it happened. And it was written in British English. So it, you'll have to get used to the cadence and the word and the verbiages. All right? The church is persecuted. Only a trio or a novice in church history will deny that. We have always defended the persecution of the Huguenots and the Spanish Inquisition, they say. When she thinks it's good to use physical force, she will use it. During the Spanish Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, this was only in Spain, 31,912 persons uh, were condemned and perished in the flame. They were burned at the stake because they became Protestants. All right? 241,450 persons were, were condemned to severe penalties, which means they were put on the rack and tortured until they finally recanted. Does the papacy fit clue number nine that he will be a persecuting people? Yes. Check that one off. Clue number 10. He will attempt to change God's law. What does it say in Daniel 7, 25? Think to change times and laws. That means he thinks he has the ability to do it, but he doesn't, God is saying. All right? The pope has power to change times and abrogate laws and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. That's pretty bold. What times and laws does the little horn attempt to change? Well, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is their church manual, they did away the second commandment. They just threw it out. Gone. What does the second commandment say? What? What? 
I think you're afraid to say, but I know you know what it says. Thou shalt not have any graven images before you. All right? All right, so they threw it out. And you shall not make for yourselves a carved image in, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath, that is in the water or under the earth. But they have carved images, don't they? Do you see one in the church? No carved images. Well, we have angels flying on the walls. All right. So he did away with the second commandment, all right? And he shortened the fourth commandment from 94 words to eight. And he split the tenth commandment into two. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, and thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife. Because they've got to have ten. I mean, they couldn't be different. If they only had nine, everybody would say, why does the Catholic Church have nine commandments and the Protestant Church has ten? So they had to do it that way, all right? So he would think to change times and laws. Which of the Ten Commandments law deals with time? Fourth. Fourth. That's exactly right. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, all right? The Sabbath was Saturday, they say, not Sunday. The church altered the observance of the Sabbath to the observance of Sunday. Protestants must be rather puzzled by the keeping of Sunday when God distinctly said, keep holy the Sabbath day. The word Sunday does not come anywhere in the Bible, so without knowing it, they are obeying the authority of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was put in power in 325 AD by Constantine, and under agreement with Constantine, they would merge the sun worshipers with the Christians and make the Catholic Church, which means universal. And in the same time, they would take the idols of the sun worshipers and make them saints in the church of the Catholic Church, and they would change the day of worship from Saturday, the old Jewish day, to Sunday. And they did it by their own authority. And that's how it all came about. So the church, on the other hand, after changing the, rest, the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath or seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. So that one says, keep holy the Lord's day, simply. All right? It is well to remind the Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, and all of the Christians that the Bible does not support them anywhere in their observance of Sunday. Sunday is an institution of the Roman Catholic Church, and those who observe the day observe a commandment of the Catholic Church. If Protestants would follow the Bible, they would worship God on the Sabbath day. In keeping the Sunday, they are following a law of the Catholic Church. The Church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. Deny the authority of the Church, and you have no adequate or reasonable explanation or justification for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday in the third Protestant fourth commandment of God. Now, when you throw out one commandment, everything goes up, all right? Now, what day of the week is Sabbath? Well, it's the seventh day of the week. I remember when I was dating my wife, we were in college, and uh, I said, why don't we go to church on, on Saturday? She goes, because it's not the seventh day of the week. And I opened the calendar and I showed her. She goes, I didn't know that. And most people don't. I mean, we just, you get, you get conditioned. That's what it is. It's all about being conditioned. All right, so here's the Catholic Church. Uh, Ten Commandments is on the left. You see they split the bottom one. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor covet your neighbor's goods. And number three, remember to keep holy the Lord's day. That's all it says. And number two, on the right side, this is the Bible one. Uh, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image is number two. It's gone in the Catholic. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Now, when I was in Peru recently, I was just a few weeks ago, I was in Peru. Um, I, I hiked the uh, Andes Mountains. The Andes Mountains are 22,500 feet above sea level. They are very, very high. In fact, is when you're hiking there, it's very few trees that are anywhere near there because you're well above tree line. And um, they recommend that you go to this town, which is Juarez. Juarez is a town that is 10,000 feet above sea level. And they say, stay there for two days and walk as much as you can. Now, I walk a lot. In fact, is today I've walked like eight and a half miles. I walk every single day like that. And it is, it is a habit. The only time I don't walk like that is if I'm sick or if there's a hurricane. If it's raining, I still walk like that. I have a Gore-Tex suit. So 
I walk all the time. It is my hobby and has been my hobby since I was a teenager. I hike long distances. And in order to stay in shape for long distance hiking, I hike every day. It's just me, all right? So I go to this town, this is Juarez, and they have Catholic churches in there. That's a beautiful Catholic church. And uh, here's another one. But they have these images all around them. You see the images at the church, and you see the image there on the wall. These are all images of saints, OK? And uh, then you go into the church, and you see uh, Mother Mary on the left-hand side. Now, I should have took the pictures, but I didn't. <clears throat> these people actually were kneeling in front of it and, and, and praying to Mary. Okay, and, and then they had statues of Jesus, okay? And people were actually kneeling in front of them, and I was trying to be careful not to disturb them because in sincerity, they are being sincere, okay? And I didn't want to be crass, if you know what I mean, all right? So this is um, at one of the centers of Juarez, and this is Mother Mary holding her son after he died, okay? And these people were gathering around. I was thinking, what are they doing? So I went grocery shopping that day, and on my way back, they're having a funeral right in front of this image, okay? And that, that's a pretty cool hearse, isn't it? I, I, that's actually a Hyundai hearse from Korea. Kind of, kind of interesting looking, but they were all gathered around it, and they were all, they were all kneeling before this and praying for the soul of this dearly departed person. All right. Now, this is in Mexico, and this one bleeds. This is Mary that bleeds blood uh, from time to time when she is really sad. And devil, the devil has power to make these kinds of miracles. So don't. Don't let it fool you. And it's, it's the opinion of many, and I hold the opinion to be true and indelible, that all God's graces are dispensed through the hands of Mary, and that the elect are brought to salvation through the Divine Mother. In conformity with this opinion, it may be said that salvation of all depends on preaching, devotion to Mary, and confidence in, in her intercession. Is that blasphemy? Yes. Now, there is no other name by where we can be saved except through whose name? Jesus. That is it. Mary is a person. Jesus is God. All right? Um, sometimes we can be heard sooner by invoking the intercession of Mary than by praying to Jesus, our Savior. But Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So this is in direct violation of the Word of God, isn't it? So we've got the Bible, Ten Commandments, and we've got the Catholic Church's Ten Commandments. Did the papacy attempt to change God's law? Yes. Check that one off. Now we're getting close to the end. Clue number 11, he will rule for 1260 years. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half time. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1260 days. She was fleeing into the wilderness because of persecution. All right. And then he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. The same time period is mentioned seven times in scriptures, time, times, and dividing of time, 42 months and 1260 days. One prophetic day equals one year in Bible prophecy. We discussed that last night. I have appointed thee each day for a year, Ezekiel 4, 6, each day for a year in Numbers 14, 34. Did the reformers understand this year day principle? Absolutely, yes. They're the ones that came up with it. These several numbers, 1260 days, 42 months, and three and a half days times, uh, in prophetic style, taking a day for a year, make the same period 1260 years. They understood it perfectly. Did the papacy reign in power in Europe for 1260 years? Well, history shows that the papacy was established in 538 AD by the decree of Justinian. So if you take 538, go all the way down, 1260 years, you come to the year 1798. What happened in 1798? Well, I will show you. Napoleon's general, Berthier, broke the Roman church's political power in the year 1798. In 1798, Encyclopedia Americana says, he, Berthier, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, established a secular one. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So there was a deadly wound in 1798. The pope was taken captive, and he died in captivity. And for 131 years, no government recognized any pope 
They fought constantly, the Catholic Church and the papacy fought constantly, trying to become the leader of Europe again, but no country ever supported them until Mussolini. We'll cover that another day. Where did we get the false theology the Antichrist would reign at the end of the world for three and a half years? From Cardinal Robert Bolarmine, who was a Jesuit. The, the papacy says, come up with a doctrine to, to thwart what these Protestant reformers are saying about the Pope being the Antichrist. So he came up with a theory that the Pope, the Antichrist would reign three and a half years at the end of time. And so it couldn't be the Antichrist. Okay? So, did anybody buy it? Well, uh, George Neg Negris, Negrinus, he said this. Now, he was a Protestant reformer. He said this Jesuit, Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, further contends that the papacy cannot be Antichrist because the papacy lasted for centuries, but the Antichrist is supposed to, re to reign only three and a half years. They're making fun of this doctrine at that time. Making fun of it. But by 1950, every single Protestant church accepted it by 1950. Isn't that remarkable? There's only one denomination that still believes what the Protestant reformers taught. And every single Protestant church taught that the papacy and the pope were the Antichrist. Every single Protestant denomination taught that for many years until 1950, and they started buying into this theory. Now, here's, a, here's a, uh, uh, the Vatican has Mary, okay, so they have a statue, Mary kicking Jerome Huss and Wycliffe out of, out of heaven, and there's a little angel down there. See the little angel on the bottom? He's ripping pages out of the Bible. Guess where, what it is? He's ripping the book of Daniel out of the Bible because it tells so much about the Antichrist. All right, did the papacy fit the clue? Number 11, he will rule for 1260 years? Yes, so we only got one more. But if one more doesn't fit, then you throw it all out, all right? So let's go to clue number 12. Cast the truth to the ground. He cast the truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. How did he do this? Well, he came up with prayers for the dead. You could pray people out of, out, of, out of purgatory and put them in heaven. Purgatory is not even in the Bible. They had to actually add books of the Bible so they could have a purgatory. All right? So veneration of angels and saints, that you can go and pray to a saint and have your prayers answered, or pray to an angel. You can't pray to them. You only pray to God. They use the images in worship in, in 375 A.D., the beginning of the exaltation of Mary, the term Mother of God in 431. The doctrine of purgatory, 593. The prayers to Mary and dead saints in 600 AD. Celibacy of the priesthood in 1079. Boy, am I glad I'm not a celibate. I really like marriage. Okay, my wife and I have been married almost 50 years. All right? It's been a wonderful, wonderful. She's, she's beautiful. One day you'll get to meet her. All right? So celibacy of the priesthood. 1079, all right, so let's go on. Indulgences, now what is indulgences? That means you can pay for your forgiveness of sins. Now, let me tell you a funny story. I'm gonna tell you this funny story, it's a good story. Okay, this is a true story, okay? So this guy, this robber, okay, he goes up to a bishop and he goes, if I give you this bag of gold, will my sins be forgiven forever and ever so that any sin I do from here on will all be forgiven? He goes, oh yeah, that's a lot of money, sure. You give me that, we'll forgive all of your sins. He goes, okay, and he gave it to him. Now he and his men were outside the city and they were coming out with their bags and bags of gold going to Rome and on the way out, they robbed him. And the man said, the, the bishop says, you're gonna go to hell for this. And he goes, I got my pass, I got my pass. And so, that's, that's a true story. Pretty cool guy. I like him. Transubstantiation was made up in 1215. Confession of sins to a priest in 1215. Purgatory proclaimed as a dogma in 1439. And tradition declared equal authority with the Bible in 1545. Apocryphal books added in 1546, Immaculate Conception of Mary. She was born without sin too. All right, 1854, infallibility of the Pope in matters of faith and morals. In 1870, Mary proclaimed the mother of the Roman Catholic Church in 1965. Does the papacy cast the truth to the ground? Yes. So all 12 of them fit 
what the reformers said it was. So what was this empire called? The Holy Roman Empire, and there was nothing holy about it. Nothing. If a man considers the origin of this great ecclesiastical dominion, he will easily perceive that the papacy is none other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. Does this empire fit the identifying marks of the little horn? Absolutely. It's a little nation. It had to rise up in the area of the Ten Kingdoms. It had to arise after 476 AD, had to subdue three kings in its rise to power, had to be more powerful than all the other horns in Europe. It had to be diverse, religious and political. It was. It had to speak pompous and blasphemous words. It did. It had to rule with someone else's power or army. It did. It had to persecute God's people. It did shall think to change God's times and laws, shall rule for a time, time, and a half time, and cast the truth to the ground. Now, you have to know that there is a God in heaven who could put all these pictures, these puzzles together, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, actually a thousand years before the papacy was ever born. Is that remarkable? There is a God in heaven, and you can trust him. We put this puzzle together because God put it there for us to do it. And if you aren't convinced now about the truth that the Pope is the Antichrist, then you are blind, all right? Blind. Now, you remember the story of the harlot riding the beasts? In Revelation 17, I told you I was going to do that on night nine. All right. Now, it's a beast power during this 1260 years, which means it's a big kingdom. But then it's a lady riding the beast. So it's the a harlot is a false church riding the kingdoms of this earth, controlling them like it's a horse. Do you understand? It changes its methods in the last days. We're going to cover these details on night nine. Now, you don't want to miss this. I'm sorry, Miho is not here. It makes me sad because she, the Japanese lady that's over there, I have a lot of Asians in my family background, and I'm, I'm partial to them because I have Asian granddaughters, and I have I have, um, I love different countries. I love different peoples. I love, I've traveled all over the world and I just like people. Can you tell that? Um, and I like different cultures. Sometimes I don't like their food. I remember, we, we spent six weeks in the country of Taiwan one summer. We spent usually four to six weeks in Taiwan visiting our children, our oldest son and the granddaughters. and. Uh, I was so tired of eating Chinese food. If I looked at another noodle, I was going to, I'm telling you, I told my wife, I just cannot eat another Chinese dish. No, no. And so we were coming back. We flew into Chicago, and we were, we were walking along in a line, you know, and there was a restaurant over here, and there was a gate. I mean, there was a fence like three feet high, and a guy was eating a, a vegetarian omelet. I said to my wife, if that guy goes to the restroom, I'm going to jump over there and eat his food. That's what I told her. She goes, Chuck. I said, I'm telling you, I went to IHOP and I had the best vegetarian omelet. I said, I'm eating it now. My wife is vegan, and I'm vegan most of the time. And I'm eating it, and my wife's going, shame on you. I said, this is so delicious. <laughs> so, so some of the food I do get tired of, but I do love people. And I love all the different cultures. It's, it's remarkable. God has created a church, and I'm talking about God's people, from all nations of the earth. And if we don't get along here, I have one of my closest friends in college. He and I ate to lunch together. His name was David Barnes. David Barnes was a black guy my age. And I said, why are you going to this school instead of going to Oakwood College, which was a black college? He and I were theology majors. And he said, the reason why I come here is because I want everybody to know if we don't get along here, we're not going to be in heaven. And isn't that true? And that has touched my heart ever since that point. We are made of all nations. And God in his mercy has given us love for each other that should exist in the heart of every born-again Christian. 
So if you're able to kneel, let us kneel. I went over tonight. I'm actually eight minutes over my, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Shall we kneel if you're able? Father in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity to study with these fine people. I ask that you will help their minds to grasp these wonderful truths that you reveal to us so graciously in your word. I do love you with all of my heart, Lord, and I know these people love you too. People say, I love you, God. Say that. I love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I tell my wife four or five times a day I love her. I tell God four or five times a day. God is good, isn't he?